throws it deep downfield. Tyree who makes the catch. What a play by Manning. And what a catch by Tyree. Manning takes the snap. Lobs it left. First is wide open. Touchdown Giants. Touchdown. Deep ball down the left sideline. And it's going to be caught. Was he inbounds? Yes. Manningham on the sideline. Brady heaves one. Down the middle of the field into the end zone. A jump ball. And it's incomplete. And the ball game's over. And the Giants have won Super Bowl 46. Welcome to the newest episode of Papa's Perspective, brought to you by Bob's Discount Furniture, the official furniture store and mattress partner of the New York Giants. I am John Schmelk. As always, we're joined by the voice of the New York football Giants, Bob Pop. And Bob, we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants a little bit on this episode because, quite frankly, the Giants haven't beat the Chargers in the last 20 years or so, so we don't have that many fun calls. We do have a couple we'll get to from a couple of games. We'll talk a little bit about Eli and Phillip Rivers, but we're going to start with you going further back in time to 1995, I went back, I looked for literally the cassette tape because that's what WFN recorded the games on in 1995. Because I'm not kidding you. They had the thing called the morgue at WFAN. It was in Mark Chernoff's old office, these huge file cabinet drawers, and they called it the morgue. And you would go back there, and it was just filled wall to wall with cassette tapes. And just so people understand how this goes, when I left FAN in 2007, I worked there from as an intern in 02, and I worked until 07 when I came here to work for the Giants. I literally scoured the morgue for three or four weeks for every single possible old audio tape that had Giant stuff on it. So I'd bring it over here, and I ended up finding everything from 2000 on because, Bob, there was a time, and this was most of the time, where... The Giants weren't on WFAN, and they were on a radio station, and you could talk about it, that is now defunct. And a lot of those old tapes just are probably sitting somewhere in, like, a box in the back of some old radio station and basement, but nobody knows where they are. Well, no, the old WNEW AM folded, and uh, it was AM and FM, you know, that was so strong in the 70s and 80s. Even into the 60s, if you go that far back. And then, John, forget about cassette tapes. I started in the world of reel-to-reel tapes. If you went into the newsroom at the old WNEWAM, the late, great John Kennelly was the sports director, and he did the Parcells show and the show from Gallagher's and the pre- and the post-game show. And Mike Preeley was the news director. They had these boxes these white boxes that had reel-to-reel tapes of them. That's how they recorded things. And they had the Kennedy assassination, and they had the man landing on the moon, That's and awesome. they had the Mets World Series. And they were they looked almost like s- small pizza boxes. And by the way, when I did Best of Imus at FAN, because I did that for about two years before I left, they still had some of those old Imus segments on reel-to-reel. And they actually had the machine. You could still cut it like the whole nine yards. Yeah, it was then, unbelievable. Listen, I, I used to edit tape that way. I mean, I would when I was working at WNEW AM and doing uh, the sports connection with Richard Neer, and we had a guy named Bill Gagan who was the producer. You know, we'd have to edit interviews, and you literally would put the two reels in, and they had this, uh, like, crayon-y kind of pencil, and you would mark where you'd want to make your edit, and then you would take up this piece of specialized tape and tape it together and hope it didn't break as you edited out segments that you didn't want. Um, and But what happened in the, in the later days of WNEWAM is in, as they were saving money, trying to save money and stay afloat once they got bought, once they, got bought um, they weren't buying a lot more tape. So what they would do is you would, in order to erase the tapes, it was called bulking it. And there was a big magnetic thing that you would turn on and you would put this real gigantic reel on it and you would rub it on it and you'd flip it over like you were cooking a burger and that tape would then be cleaned right. and then you would record over it. Um, so, so many great things got lost. There was a guy who was, uh, who was brought in in the late 80s named Gary Brandt, who was the finest gentleman who became the producer, the executive producer of the Giants broadcast. And Gary was great, had a great relationship with the Giants. He was a real professional. And he tried to start archiving things because he knew where this was headed. So he started grabbing the reel to reels and putting them on cassettes or carts or whatever to try to save some of this. But so many things got lost 
in the bulking of tapes. Yeah, so in terms of like calls, I have pretty much everything since the 2001 season onwards. Before then, uh, we found, oh gosh, I forget the guy's name, Bob. There's a guy that literally collects old broadcasts of games, and he has a website, and you can get them from him. I got a couple where I think he literally had like a microphone up to his like TV monitor for like the 86 Super Bowl. So we have a couple full games that way. And of course, we have stuff all of the old NFL films videos and, you know, tapes that, you know, Stephen Diddy had back in the day, too. He's one of the guys that works here in our video department. And, you know, we can pull stuff off of those. But in terms of full calls, that's why we can't go much deeper than 2000 because. The, the tapes are either sitting in some former WNEW producer's basement or they've been bulked or been completely erased. So, anyway, let's go back to 1995, Bob. Is this something you want to talk about? I wasn't there. I was 14. You were. It was your first year doing play-by-play for the Giants. Well, yeah, and uh, it's a regular season finale, and the Giants are playing the Chargers at the old Giants stadium. Now, the Giants are going nowhere. Uh, this is... Dan Reeves, second to last year as the head coach. The Giants would finish 5-11. and 11. That would be their worst record since Bill Parcells' first year as head coach in 1983. So it's 13 years they hadn't had a record like this. Parcells' first year, they only had three wins. Uh, in Reeves' third year, because he took over in 93, 5-11 was like complete despair. So it snowed all week. Okay, it snowed all week. The Chargers are coming to town, and the Chargers are, like, on their way to the playoffs. And I'll never forget this because the night before the game, we got hit with, like, another foot of snow. So the people that ran Giant Stadium, they worked their tails off, volunteers, staff, to clear out the aisles to get people in. Now, only about 50,000 fans showed up because the Giants weren't going anywhere. And they couldn't get all the snow out of the seats. I mean, they got the out of the aisles for people to get to the seats. So what do people do when they're bored and the team's not doing? Well, they start snowball fights. <laughs> well, it went from people throwing snow at each other to now people start firing snowballs down on the field. And I remember uh, there was a player on the Chargers who had an interception. I'm trying to remember uh, what his name was. Um, but anyway, he got an interception as he's running. <laughs> He was getting pelted. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> some good throws to get him all the way out onto the field. Yeah, I but the say. trainer, uh, the the equipment guy for the Chargers, he got hit in the head. Oh, uh, you can't bad. do that. No, can't. And it that. was it to the point where Bob Shepard, the late great PA announcer, you know, made an announcement, and the the game was almost forfeited. The game was almost forfeited. And Dan Reeves, I remember him saying, I, I wouldn't have been upset if it was forfeited. And the late Wellington Mara, I thought, agreed as well that, you know, the fans' behavior um, was just, you know, it, it, it got bad. In fact, the Giants took out an ad, a full-page ad. They paid for a full-page ad in the San Diego newspapers the following day apologizing. Really? To the Chargers and to Chargers fans. Wow for the behavior of the snowballs. But, yeah, that was the way the first year as the voice of the Giants ended with the snowball game against the Chargers well, and Giants. Well, you know, what people then do, they pack the snow and they put some liquid in there and they freeze them, and then all of a well, sudden it gets really, yeah, really it was dangerous. Cold. It's yeah. a problem, right? Yeah, so, and there was all, it was also like there was ice, there was snow. It was, right. it was not a good situation. No. Um, and the situations with the Giants and the Chargers didn't get better as we moved along here, Bob. So let's talk about the connections between these two teams, and then we'll kind of go back and talk about a couple of our, our, our colleagues that we've worked with back in the day. But Giants and Chargers, obviously they make a big trade on draft day, the Phillip rivers Eli Manning trade. And, you know, that was a situation, and maybe you could talk about this a little bit, you know, Archie and his experience in the National Football League. You know, that impacted how we talked to Eli about his decisions with the draft. But with that year, with Eli, Roethlisberger, and Rivers all going, in the end, all three guys seemed to wind up where they needed to wind up to be successful. I agree with you on that one. And look, the Chargers were a mess um, because you had a general manager at the time who did not get along with the head coach, Marty Schottenheimer. And they were at odds, okay? So it was kind of a dysfunctional situation. There was this whole thing. They needed a new stadium back then. 
Okay, yeah. that uh, they they the old Murph, the Jack Murphy Stadium, uh, is where the Chargers played. In fact, the, the the Niners, the Chargers, and the Raiders had the three worst field situation stadium situations in the NFL. They were old, archaic baseball stadiums that they would reconfigure for football. Well, that's the thing, by the way. Some teams say, "Oh, we need a new stadium." They really needed a new stadium. So there was always this talk that the Chargers may move so on and so forth, and there was friction. I mean, Schottenheimer got fired after a 14-2 and two season. And I think, you know, the Mannings just wanted stability um, and a stable situation, and the Giants were a stable situation with ownership, the hiring of Tom Coughlin coming in, uh, who was coming, you know, who had been let go by the Jaguars but had built the Jaguars franchise. So – yeah, and Roethlisberger going to Pittsburgh. Look, the Giants loved Roethlisberger, too. Um, but the Chargers fans forever will always hold it against Eli Manning that he didn't want to go play there. But it worked out for Eli. Yeah, and then they first played. And I'm, I'm going to play one highlight from this game because um, I think you'll enjoy it. And Bob hasn't heard this yet, so I want to get his reaction as he listens to it, too. But, Bob, that was a really big deal when the Giants went to play at San Diego on September 25th, 2005, it turned out to be a 45-23 Giants loss in that game. Uh, and the two quarterbacks, you know, this was – Phillip Rivers wasn't playing yet, right? This was Drew Brees that Drew was Brees still the was quarterback still for the Chargers. And Eli played pretty well in that game, 24-41, 352, a pair of touchdowns, no picks. But, boy, the Charger fans remembered that day, and they were a little cranky. Oh, right. yeah, they were very cranky. Uh, I thought the Chargers organization – was a little Bush League, too, in some of the video stuff that they were putting on the board during the game. What did they do? And all that stuff. They were just kind of putting up these faces, and I think they really played loose and fast with the rules of what could be on the board once play started. Um, and there was a lot of music, and there was, you know, they they were they, they got caught up in it, too. And, um, look, I thought Eli handled it as good as he could. I Shocking. Mean, this was Eli's Eli in that regard, yeah, right? Yeah, and I mean – the Chargers were a really good team. Um, you know, the Giants, this was Eli's first full year as a starter. Uh, the Giants would obviously make the playoffs in 2005. It was a tough environment. I mean, the sports talk radio, the fan base, because remember, Breeze was playing. Rivers wasn't playing. He was on the bench. And the fan base was just in this frenzy. The town was in a frenzy that Eli Manning was playing there, and he had turned them down. No question about it. And in that game, LaDainian Tomlinson went for 192 in that game. Yeah. He had three touchdowns on the ground, but he also had a touchdown through the air, which is one of my favorite Bob Papa calls of all time. Gates split out left. Toss right. Pass. Tomlinson, he's going to throw it. Lobs it downfield. Wide open. Marquette, 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 and he catches it for the touchdown. <laughs> Do you even remember that call? Do you remember no. that call? Not be able to get out of McCardell? Twice. Yeah, Keenan McCardell. Yeah, that name always that. That's a, so there's certain names that like always get yeah because it's like Keenan McCardell. There's like a lot of n sounds in there and quick. And how about Dick Lynch in the background? Oh, it's gonna be yes. <laughs> but yeah, I the guys I've done this with Bob now since 2006. I have never heard him not be able to get out a name. And that is literally one of the only times. One more. Downfield, wide open, Marquette, 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 and he catches it for the touchdown. <laughs> pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah, Keenan McCardell. <laughs> As opposed to just saying McCardell. I, I, I felt like I had to say his first name, Keenan McCardell. Keenan well, McCardell. And you know what's funny, and, and this is probably a good opportunity now to, to, to talk briefly about Dick Lynch, because you hear him in the background of all these calls, Bob, and if you go to broadcaster school, They'll tell, you, they'll tell you if you do in color, don't talk while the play-by-play -play is going. But it, it, sometimes like that, it added something. Because he would see it, just give one word, and it would give the fans an idea of what to expect and what was coming next. Well, D Dick Lynch was the Phil Rizzuto for Giants broadcast. You had the lovable former Yankee Phil Rizzuto who would be funny. He would say like whatever was on his mind at the moment. Um and Dick Lynch was that for Giants fans. Uh, you know, he's a guy that was part of the great Giants teams of the 50s and early 60s. And he had been there. He had done that. He was a star at Notre Dame. And he didn't really care. I mean, he was a guy, you know, he worked. 
on Wall Street. Um, he did the games. Uh, he was a huge Giants fan. He loved the organization. Um, he loved the Mara family, uh, would do anything for him, would never talk badly about uh, the organization or the team uh, in a mean-spirited way. But he would also, if it, it was football wasn't good, he would be more than happy to share that with you. The other thing about Dick Lynch, which I always, you know, because he sounded on the air funny, and sometimes he would have, Malaprops and he'd say things and phrases that were kind of off center or whatever. And you'd be like, what did he just say? But he really knew football and his X's and O's acumen, not on the level like today where we, where guys talk about, you know, the three technique and the five technique and shading over the guard and making sure you have great leverage and high pointing and all. Now he talked like a normal person and he was funny. He always had, you know, his doctor friend that was sitting in the stands that he would say before the game that so-and-so was there and his daughter Jennifer and his grandkids or his son or whomever, and he made it fun. You know, little birthday wishes a la Phil Rizzuto. Uh, we talk about Gallagher's Steakhouse or P.J. Clark's and hanging out. And Matt this Sherman and that. cigars. Yeah. Oh, Bobby. Um, <laughs> Touchdown. But, but what was very underrated about Dick Lynch is he would be watching. He would before the game. He would just say before the broadcast, well, here's what the Giants have to do. Here's what they need to do here. Here's what they have to do to win this game or or if they were getting beaten in a certain area. And. You know, he was spot on. And and as the game was unfolding in his own unique way, he could tell you what was working, what was not working. And he was tough as nails. I mean, tough as nails, Bob. I remember I was only with Dick for a couple years doing the games. But I remember in 2007, that Super Bowl run, when he was sick, right? And we go into Green Bay, negative, you know, 20 degree real feel. We're in the booth. We have those windows open. And there wasn't a whisper of a complaint from him about no. please close the windows. He wanted them open. He, he listen, Dick. Dick was he was from another generation. You know, he was from a a hard, tough nosed minded generation, and he didn't let things bother him. Uh, he would tell you where you stood. Uh, he was really good with a needle uh, if he wanted to give you a little dig, and. You know, what he battled through that last season as uh, radio analyst for the Giants, he didn't tell anybody that he was sick, did not tell, didn't tell anybody. He just battled through it. And, um, you know, I miss him every day. He was the best. And then can we talk briefly just before I want to jump to the next thing really quick, what it was like trying to integrate into a three man booth there? as we kind of shifted Carl upstairs for that run? Well, before that, there was a lot of other guys. That sure. WFAN tried to shift in there. I mean, we had a whole host of guys that they rolled through. And the thing that Dick, the thing that Dick, if he felt that guys were putting the effort in, because he put the effort in in his own way. He might come out to practice or he, his preparation was unique to him. Despite, you know, visiting somebody's tailgate before the game or after the game or whatever, he put in his own kind of work. And if he felt that guys were just coming in there and they were being plopped in there to kind of replace him and they weren't putting in the effort, he really could be tough on him in the booth. He could really be tough. Now, obviously, when Dave Jennings was let go by the Jets, Jennings was obviously a great player for the Giants and was a fantastic uh, radio analyst. And again, cut from a different era. You, you, you're not getting a punter to be the main radio analyst or TV analyst on television or, or, or for a team. But Dave Jennings was awesome, and he knew the rules. So Dick, Dick respected Dave. He knew Dave. He welcomed Dave into the booth. And then when it was time for Carl, obviously Dick had called all those games. When Carl was a player, Dick had tremendous respect for Mark Bavaro. Bavaro and Carl were very tight based on their competition and practice every day and training camp. So, uh, again, Carl put in the work. 
Dick welcomed him. It was really a matter of if he felt the guys were working, he'd be more than happy to share. All right, this is how I'm going to transition. As you mentioned, Dave Jennings. I want to go to the 2009 game at Giants and Chargers here, Bob. And this might be a stretch of a connection, but I'm making it anyway. The Giants lost this game uh, 21-20. But one of our current broadcast partners actually had, had a role in that loss. So now a 39-yard field goal attempt coming up for Lawrence Tynes with Fiegels to hold. Fiegels gets set with Tynes. Snap is good. And it's bobbled by Fiegels. And then he gets tackled on the spot. Fiegels mishandled the snap. And the Giants come away with no points. Which is something that rarely happened, by the way. Jeff was great holder and all that stuff. But you mentioned Dave Jennings. And we have a kind of a history here. Jeff's now one of our broadcast partners here. Mm-hmm. The Giants were not afraid to put their special teams guys and their punters into the booth. We've heard Sean Landette on our stuff before, too. You know, working with Dave, for me, was... To your point, he was so intelligent, and he knew the rules inside and out. And he said things quietly with a soft voice, but they carried so much substance with him because you knew that he would not say something and be forceful on something unless he really believed it. Yeah, and he was very prepared. Uh, Dave would be at practice all the time. Um, Dave was uh, inquisitive. He was best buds with Bill Belichick. So he had that pipeline to Bill Belichick uh, to pick his brain. Um, and, you know, now when you listen to or watch a broadcast, it is expected that the announcers that you're watching on TV or you're listening to on the radio know all the rules. In fact, the league has gone out of their way to have rule seminars for their broadcast partners. Um The uh, officials will come in during training camp pre-COVID and have a little seminar like they would do with the players. They show you all the new areas of emphasis. Well, rewind back. A lot of the broadcasters didn't stay up on the rules, (laughs) know the rules, nor did they have the kind of access to things that the NFL now provides for their broadcast partners. But Dave Jennings, he was really smart because – He knew the game. Dave was a great athlete as well. Dave knew the game, understood the game, but he realized, I think he realized to him, he probably, you know, to himself realized, well, what's going to separate me from all the other people doing it? Because I'm a former punter. So what's going to separate me? And Dave made it his life's work to know every detail of just about every rule and have it ready the top of his head when situations arose nobody else was on top of it like that people were guys would guess on the air guys would watch replays and sort of try to figure out what was going Jennings knew the rules to a T so that if something happened you'd look to Dave and Dave would explain exactly what the rule was as if he was reading it out of the rule book that made him a difference maker and made him a very important figure in broadcasting because I think because he was in New York for all those years with the Jets and then with us for the, with the Giants and the media columnists that would listen and watch and everything else, I think they started citing that Dave Jennings on Jets radio and then Giants radio, he had the rule down, he had it cold. And I think he put pressure on people who were making a lot more money doing it on network TV to make sure that they got it right. So I think Dave Jennings, in a lot of ways, changed things for people. And, Bob, Dave Jennings also, one of the first hits of what was the original iteration of Big Blue Kickoff, which was Big Blue Hits, which we did from the conference room in the old Giants offices inside the old Giants stadium. When we first did Big Blue Hits, which is basically like a jury-rigged setup, no calls, just, you know, it was kind of like a podcast before a podcast or a podcast, and... We did that, and Dave was one of the first guys I did that with. So I always remember that, how he helped us kind of get this whole thing started. Now, Bob, we talked about how Dick Lynch kind of battled through his his illness in his final year, but nobody knew. Unfortunately, with Dave, who was stricken with Parkinson's disease, that's something we all kind of saw happen and go along, which was, you know, really sad for all of us because we all loved and and respected Dave. But he was someone that, that still showed up and did the best he could fighting through you know, for anyone that's dealt with anyone that has Parkinson's, it's just a 
debilitating disease. And, you know, for people that don't know, Dave was a tremendous athlete too. And it just slows you down physically, your ability to speak. And for him to, you know, he was always sharp. He could knew everything that was going on, but sometimes he just had trouble verbalizing it because of the Parkinson's. And it was just a, a, a really tough thing for, for everybody to go through. But, but Dave really fought through it as best he could. Yeah, I mean, he was a tremendous basketball player. He was a great athlete. He loved working out before working out became chic. Um, he was always tremendous. for And, yeah, to watch the deterioration, but to watch the – Grace and dignity yeah. in which he handled all of this uh, was an inspiration. And uh, obviously we became very friendly. Um, we were very friendly over the years um, because I think he always loved the Giants. And I think the fact that the Mara and Tish family, when he was ridiculously let go by the Jets, immediately added him back into the equation. Uh, which is why our broadcast booth has his picture in it here at Matt Live Stadium. It's the Dave Jennings broadcast booth, and he has Giants and Jets. It works. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, it's pretty cool. Um, Dave, I'll give you one funny little quirky thing about Dave Jennings. He was very punctual. He was very meticulous in his preparation. His notes. He he followed a very set routine, and he was obsessed with flight time. So whenever we would get on the team charter and we'd get on the plane, he would have his stopwatch. And as soon as the plane lifted off, he would hit start. Is that true? And he would run his stopwatch the, to the minute we touched down. And he would give you the exact time of the flight. Because, you know, the pilots and flight attendants always come on and they say, okay, you know, we're, flight time is an hour and 38 minutes or whatever like that. And Jennings would be like, no, it's an hour and 26. And <laughs> so. All right, two more things before they say we goodbye. I couldn't find the, the audio, Bob. I'm, I'm going to still try to find this, see if I can edit it in before this posts. But there was a, I think it was a preseason game, and it was you, Dick, and Dave in the booth together. And the officials were just botching calls left and right. Some things never change. And <laughs> you guys had got, you guys just started laughing. And I, this is something I've seen happen with Bob before. Not just on the air, by the way. But when you get Bob on something funny and he starts laughing sometimes, he can't stop. And all I remember is that you literally can't talk because Dave and Dick made you laugh so hard. And at one point, Dave threw giggles and goes, Bob, you got to get it together. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, I do remember uh, it. I, well, it's even, <laughs> even in the TV shows that we do here. Usually it's tied into fatigue. So if I'm really tired... Um, you know, whatever, you know, because at that time I, I was, I probably was doing Nets games as well. I was doing boxing on ESPN. I mean, I had one time where I did a, a boxing match for ESPN in Juarez, Mexico on a Friday night. I flew to San Diego Friday morning, went into Juarez, Mexico, did the fight, drove back, had a car take me back to the airport in San Diego, took a red eye home, and then did a giant game on Saturday. I think this was in 97 when the Giants beat Washington in Giants Stadium to win the division. And then that night I had a Nets game over at the Meadowlands Arena. <clears throat> so I get a little tired. I get a little punchy. <laughs> and because it was a preseason game, once I get going with something that I find funny, it's hard to regroup. <laughs> How regroup. many times in the TV studio have we had to like take a break because I like I all of a sudden I go into this laughing spell. I can't stop. It's true. All right. Final thing before we say goodbye. You talked about a couple of the colleagues that we've lost in Dick Lynch and Dave Jennings, a producer that I met in the game that we went down to, I believe it was Charlotte. Carolina, right? I, I met Tom Tracy, who is your former producer. So Richard near down there as well, Richard's obviously still with us on FAN. But um, can you talk a little bit about Tom and you know who was with you guys for a long time producing the games in the booth? Uh, he was the mother hen. He had a, he was uh, from the South. He came up to New York when he was just a kid. Um, kind of raised himself. You know, lived in Harlem. Uh, was in all the speakeasies, nightclubs, whatever. Uh, he had unbelievable stories. Really didn't know a ton about football. But he worked in the music department at WNEWAM. And he was a guy that pulled the, the shows because when the DJs would come in to play all that Sinatra music and Ella Fitzgerald and all this other stuff, you know, the, the, the Tom Tracy and another guy named Bob Taylor, they would pull the music for each DJ. And here was the sequence of carts and songs. Guy was brilliant. 
He was right out of the street. He knew everybody. Um, he had a relationship with Mrs. Mara, Mrs. Ann Mara, that was second to none. Like sometimes in the hotel, he would have breakfast with her on a road game. But the first game I ever did filling in for Jim Gordon, who was sick, was in Anaheim in 92 when the Giants played the Rams. And then I got, I, I got to do a game with the Giants and Dolphins uh, in Miami in 93. And Dick couldn't have been better. He treated me like royalty. He knew that eventually when Jim Gordon retired that this would be a spot for me. Um, he was caring. He was protective. But if you crossed him, he would MF you. I mean, he had, the, he had some kind of vocabulary. And he had phrases that, you know, it was hilarious. And by, by the way, you said Dick, by the way. You mean Tom, right? You're talking Tom, about, yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah. And would always be dressed to the nines. He had a little derby hat on, the goatee. And he would, he was just, he knew everybody. Everybody loved Tom Tracy. Um, and he was one of those characters that just doesn't exist anymore. It's like from another era, there'll never be another Tom Tracy. I told you we'd be all over the map. I wasn't lying, but it was fun. Thanks, Bob. Uh, John, pleasure. Papa's Perspective, brought to you by Bob's Discount Furniture, the official furniture store and matches partner of the New York Giants. That's another episode of Papa's Perspective. Next week, uh, we have our pick of a bunch of games for this one, the Dallas Cowboys. It'll be a lot of fun. Join us next week for another episode of Papa's Perspective on the Giants Huddle podcast feed.